Hi everybody, uh, my name is Jason Chapin, Director of Workforce Development at the Westchester County Association. Thank you for joining our video chat today and it's going to be a great chat. I'm very happy to um, be here today with David Kessler, the CEO of Cone Resnick and Stephen Harrison, the office managing partner in the White Plains office. And uh, they are going to be sharing their expertise and telling us lots of great things. I also want to thank our platinum sponsors at WCA for making this possible. All right, so we have a lot to talk about, and there's a lot of uh, things going on, and uh, what we want to do today is focus on remote work, and I'd like to start with you, David, to um, really divide this into two parts. We know what the world was like pre-pandemic, and I know that Cone Resnick had a remote work policy in place. And uh, if you could tell us about that as well to tell us about some of the adjustments you've made now that we're in the midst of a pandemic and, um, and adjusting to all of that. Sure. Uh, thank you so much, Jason. Yeah, it, it's interesting how things have changed from just uh, three and a half weeks ago. Uh, prior to the pandemic, uh, Code Resnick did have a vibrant um, uh, remote workplace um, uh, strategy. And we've had, we have 100% um, uh, remote with some employees that work in geographies where we don't have offices and will commute to clients when we need them to commute. And then we also were very, um, I think, proactive with a work-life balance strategy and encouraging people to work from home one or two days a week um, or as needed. Uh, and then, you know, shift to where we are just starting three and a half weeks ago and when we first um, started to think about the the remote workforce prior to any any action with people you know being required to work from home um, our, our uh, COO and head of technology wanted to do an experiment and they asked everybody please sign in at 9 p.m. from your homes and let's see what happens and we had about a thousand of our 3,000 employees do that and uh, it worked out pretty well. Um, and then, of course, fast forward just uh, three days after that, when all the states started uh, declaring the, the um, uh, work, work from home. And you know, we've been doing it successfully now into our fourth week with uh, 3,000 people from all over the country and through other parts of the world uh, working remotely from home. So it's been um, an interesting experience and, and a lot to get used to, as uh, Steve and I have uh, felt firsthand. All right, great. So Stephen, if you could tell us some of the uh, things that you've um, experienced in the White Plains office, that would be great. Uh, sure. You, you know, although maybe we've been better prepared than most, I, I don't think anyone was completely prepared for the COVID-19 crisis. There's simply no playbook out there to follow. So let me walk you through some of the events of the last four weeks as it pertains to the White Plains office. You know, on Friday the 13th of March, we, we mandated that everyone work from home. We allowed everyone to take their office laptop and monitor screen home with them. Uh, we were able to transfer the calls coming into the office directly to the home computers through a technology tool called Jabber, which is a product of Cisco. Uh, Jabber also allows you to call each other directly through the computer, you know, and Prior to this uh, pandemic, I barely ever used Jabber. Today, I use Jabber every day to communicate with my teams uh, within Cone Resnick while working from home. It's very easy to use. You just start dialing, uh, typing the name, the contact, and the numbers come up. You hit a call button, and, and it's all through the computer. So it's, it's pretty neat. Um, you know, initially, uh, some employees had difficulty logging in, in, into the systems from home because it was new to them, you know, but our su support team has done a great job at getting everybody up and ro running. Um, you know, today we only have one person who goes into the White Plains office on Monday and Thursday of each week to primarily deal with the mail. You know, communication and flexibility is the key in managing a remote workplace. Initially, you know, I had daily conference calls with top management of the firm, then with top management of the Northeast region, and then with the employees of the White Plains office. 
our goal is to over communicate with our people. Uh, and since we have multiple offices, we also want to make sure our messaging is consistent throughout the firm. The way we manage the office has not significantly changed. You, you know, we continue to have our weekly scheduling meetings for both tax and audit engagement teams. And I review the staff productivity reports on a daily and weekly basis. However, the biggest issue is that there's much more concern of how the individual team members are actually doing. You know, I could look at a management re report that tells me they are still proactive, but how are they really holding up? It's very difficult not being able to see them in person. Uh, we recognize that people are, are, are not living normal lives right now. Um, and I think we'll talk about this topic a little bit more uh, on this particular discussion. So, you know, again, the communication and flexibility is the key. You know, David provides his weekly voice with mail greetings to all employees from wide. And I continue with my daily emails and weekly conference calls with, with the White Plains office team. Um, the other thought is that this communication is equally as important to our clients and other key relationships. Um, clients are experiencing the same or greater disruption, and we want them to know we are here and ready to help. So that's very interesting that you have to be very in touch with your clients and you also have to be very in touch with your colleagues and you have to monitor how they're doing and, and provide assistance uh, whenever possible. And uh, so Cohn Resnick is one of the largest tax accounting and business advisory firms in the country. So you're looking at things from different perspectives. And David, if you could share with us some of the, uh, the ways that you've been conducting business from a remote work standpoint and what information you've been sharing with some of your clients and some of your colleagues so that everybody can get over the anxiety of making this transition and making the most of, um, of this uh, time that we're in and, uh, and helping each other through it. Yeah, first, um, Jason, you know, it's, it, it's a um, new experience, as Steve said, for everybody. Um, and, you know, we would be remiss if we didn't thank all the healthcare workers that are out there. Uh, and, and, you know, we, we see it on the news and we have loved ones that are experiencing um, uh, pains, either themselves uh, and employees as well. Um, you know, so the first thing, you know, that, that we were very cognizant of was, only having people in the workplace that that was absolutely necessary and we were very serious about that and I think now everybody understands um, and is sensitive to that but uh, three weeks ago uh, you know it was, it was hard for everyone to conceptualize that no you can't be in the office and so you know our office services has been doing a fantastic job we monitor um, anybody that goes in there through their swipes um, we want to be prepared for anybody that needs to be in the office. Um, we have people coming in and, uh, and getting mail and, and, and checks and uh, uh, dispersing mail to, to all of our staff. Um, as it relates to, you know, throughout the firm, um, our employees coordinate and collaborate throughout the firm with each other. And they're using our technologies and our tools, whether it's WebEx or Microsoft Teams, and they're doing video calls. And one of the things is we're trying to mix in um, socializing as well as the, the, the workflow that needs to happen. So we have video happy hours, and I've been invited to video happy hours throughout the whole entire firm. So, you know, it, 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 it's great. You know, I start at 6 o'clock on the East Coast, and then it goes, you know, at 9 o'clock on, on the West Coast. Um, and then uh, we have calls throughout the world as well. I was on a call um, through our uh, Nexia affiliation of global firms, and we had people at 6 in the morning all the way up to 10 o'clock at night in Australia. Um, but as it relates to clients, you know, we have to be very cognizant of the environment that the client is in as well. Um, a lot of them can't come to their offices, and we're dealing in a remote environment uh, with keeping the workflow going. And then, of course, we're so involved lately on all of the CARES Act relief that's available to small businesses, to medium-sized businesses. And we've been spending a lot of time helping companies try to figure out how to access some of this relief. And that's what's been keeping us busy. But the remote environment, um, you know, we're, we're all getting accustomed, accustomed to from a personal standpoint. Um, and the technology 
t- technology's been great, and I have a feeling there's going to be a new paradigm with people um, taking advantage of working remotely more in the future. And unfortunately, it took this type of circumstance to um, let us realize we could do it. All right. And Stephen, I know that um, you are very in tune with your colleagues and you're always trying to stay connected with them. And I know we were talking earlier about some of the things that um, your colleagues are doing uh, during the day in order to uh, stay connected and also to make sure that they're um, not overwhelmed with uh, everything that they have to uh, handle right now. What are some of the things that uh, you're doing that you would like to share with others? Uh, Sure. You know, we all should, there's a heightened awareness of the stress to our people brought on by COVID-19. You know, people have loved ones who have tested positive. Um, People are finding it difficult to work from home and are struggling a bit. Uh, People fear being terminated from employment. Um, uh, People miss the social connection that is now lacking. And everyone has cabin fever. So so we're trying to figure out how to lighten up the mood um, in the situation. You know, David had mentioned a couple of items, um, but one thing that we we actually put into place this week, um, we're requiring a daily one-hour break from 3 to 4 p.m. each day in White Plains office. Uh, no employee meetings are to be scheduled during this one-hour break. It's meant to, you know, spend quality time with your family or take a, a walk outside and, and without feeling guilty or pressure while not working. All right. So, uh, do you have a virtual water cooler? That we do. You know, it, it's a it, it's on our intranet. It's a place to for people to post items of interest, and again to bond with your colleagues. Um, you, you know, with all of this, we still need to keep up with the continuous and timely feedback and recognition for our people. You know, we we need to stay current with the performance evaluation process. We still need to promote the SPOT Awards program, and we need to continue to schedule meetings with performance coaches. So, And we need to do all this virtually. Um, one other item, it's a small item, but it's important to us, is, you know, from working at home, the shredding services do not exist at home. <laughs> so we are requiring our um, people to, to not discard client competence information in a weekly garbage so we need to if you are going to make photocopies at home can you put it off the side and then when we do get back um, to a little bit of uh, normal operation when people are back in the office just bring it to the office and then we'll be able to properly shred it and discard uh, that confidential information Okay. And, and David, I'm going to back up a little bit. You were talking about the CARES Act and maybe the, um, the payroll protection program. And I know that you're providing a lot of information, a lot of counsel to your clients. Is there anything in coming out of Washington that relates to remote work, uh, anything that you're doing uh, that um, you think others should be aware of? Um, you know, is payroll protection program, is that helping more employers keep their staff? And, and if they're able to work remotely, then it's probably an adjustment, but it's not a major shift. But there may be instances where you have some clients who are in the manufacturing sector and, you know, maybe there are parts of the CARES Act that are helping them. But from a remote work standpoint, their whole uh, way of operating has changed and they may not be able to do things like, say, uh, those who are in your field who have already been working remotely and now they're just spending more time working remotely. So just any thoughts you have about the CARES Act and the payroll protection program as it pertains to remote work? Yeah, it, uh, the uh, it's interesting. One of the things we're doing is we're spending a lot of time advising clients on how to access some, some of this uh, relief. Um, you know, everybody, the, the thing that's interesting that's happening now is there's a cascading effect. It's a domino effect. And we, we work with so many different industries that we're seeing um, the impact across all industries. You know, so when restaurants and hotels are closing down, that's impacting, you know, obviously the employees, but it's impacting the food service providers. 
the, dis the distributors, manufacturing, distribution channels, real estate, it's impacting real estate. We have a big real estate and construction practice, um, retail and consumer. So there is such a dramatic impact from what's happening here. And you, know, you can see the millions and millions and millions of jobs um, that, that are being lost. Um, there's, uh, we have a legislative uh, aid that is on Capitol Hill that's trying to drive some of the stuff that's going on. Um, there, there's ongoing um, relief being discussed as we speak. Um, with the small business program, there is payroll relief available. Uh, and then for mid-sized companies, uh, 500 to 10,000, there's, there's a lot of uh, different types of programs out there. So we're helping clients through these programs. Um, the other thing I want to point out also is we're advising clients um, on the variable expenses non-essential expenses and that also is impacting the economy because every business has non-essential expenses and then that impacts all of the different service providers and vendors that are out there um, and their businesses get impacted um, so everybody's got to look at preserving cash everybody's got to look at um, dealing with your lenders your investors and and your landlords and you know there's an impact um, throughout the whole entire food chain um, in this regard. Uh, so, so we're very much involved with uh, being on the forefront of what's happening and trying to interpret because as the legislation comes out, the regulations haven't been finalized. So there's a period of time where you really have to navigate through all this stuff. All right. So uh, I wanted to ask um, Stephen a question about what's going on locally. But before I do, I just want to remind our viewers that if you have any questions for David or Stephen, just um, uh, send us a message and we will try and get to it before we finish here today. And also a reminder that this is going to be, this is recorded and it'll be available on demand uh, after we're done. Uh, this afternoon. So, uh, Stephen, if you could tell us, I know you do a lot of work in the construction and real estate industries, and if you could share anything that you're um, focused on now during the pandemic with those industries or other industries and anything else that's going on here in Westchester that uh, you're um, getting involved with that you think others should be aware of. Sure, sure. Yeah, I'm the Northeast leader of the construction industry industry practice, so uh, I have a very close relationship with all of the significant contractors in, in, in the local marketplace. Um, you know, for the most part, um, all they've been coming off of a five-year positive run, so so they are pretty well capitalized to weather some of this storm. Um, you know, of many, many, many of their jobs have been stopped currently. Uh, the heavy civil Contractors have some, some work ongoing um, for emergency uh, purposes, um, and everybody's in a wait and see. You know, everybody's very eager to get back out there to continue with the construction activity. Um, and they're, they're, they're hoping that the, the, the activity startup will work closely with the loans being generated from the payroll uh, protection program uh, you know, with the purpose of forgiveness after the eight-week period, and they're hoping that aligns pretty well. Um, the the other thing, you know, in Westchester, as as we know, you know, the medical, um, the healthcare industry is really, you know, the, the most significant employer, you know, in the Westchester County marketplace. And I just want to point out, it, it's. You have a situation currently that hopefully we're, we're, we're nearing or at the apex of the COVID uh, pandemic and the hospital emergency rooms are being flooded at historic rates. On the flip side, due to the social distancing, no one is going to see the doctors unless it is emergent. So, so you have two segments moving in opposite directions. And, you know, the physicians and clinics have had patient volume drop about 50 to 60 percent you know, looking at wage reductions to stay alive. Hospitals are seeing a dip in elective surgeries, but overloaded in their emergency rooms and expecting huge admissions, not enough staff, and a lack of equipment and supplies. Each of these segments have different needs. So again, you know, we have expertise within our advisory group that could help, you know, employers navigate through the decision-making process, but, but, but it's complicated. 
Yes, there's a lot of information flowing, and it's very hard to try and process it all in real time and, and uh, keep up with it all. Uh, so talking about keeping up with it all, I was visiting the ConResnick.com website, and you have a, um, a COVID-19 uh, page, and just wanted to ask you, David, um, uh, how important is that to get that information out to your clients and your employees? And if you're getting any feedback on the information that you're putting on your website and, and getting out through other channels. Yeah, absolutely, Jason. Thanks for pointing that out. And um, it's very important to, um, you know, not only look at our website and get all the information you can that's available to uh, help your business, but also... Um, all the other information that's out there. We've been conducting webinars. We've been doing industry-specific um, seminars for clients and friends to understand what's available and, and how to navigate through this time. You know, there's a period of, you know, we call it the now, the new, and the next. And you really have to figure out how are you going to deal with the now? And sometimes it's really helpful to have perspectives from beyond what, what you're used to. You know, we're finding that businesses, you know, the first thing you need to do is protect your employees. That's the most important thing. Protect your employees, figure out ways to do that. And if you get rid of non-essential expenses, take advantage of the government programs that are out there. Um, use somebody to help you take advantage of these programs um, to, to understand them and what's available to you. And then diversification is becoming extremely important. If you look at all the businesses that are having to reinvent themselves on the fly right now, um, and then insurance requirements, very significant. A lot of people don't understand uh, what's in their insurance policies and, and what remedies that they have. But, you know, we're seeing uh, restaurants and other businesses, including our own, convert into different revenue streams um, at a necessity. And, you know, now you have uh, delivery and walk up. And uh, I think, you know, there's going to be uh, a whole new view of, of how to deal with the now, but also, you know, what the next step is, and then how to create some diversification and, and risk mitigation for the future. All right. And Stephen, any thoughts on that as well with uh, the information that you have on your website and the different ways you're sharing information with your clients and your colleagues if you're getting any feedback from them? Um, I think people are very appreciative of all the special efforts that, you know, the entire Cohen Resnick team has been putting forth. Um, you know, this whole process with the payroll they're all protection program is a great example with things changing constantly and not being clear and moving quickly. Um, you know, our clients, it, it's a great time to strengthen that, that trusted business advisor role that we play with our clients. Um, it's extremely important. People are appreciative. It, it's, you know, our resource page started out with one or two items. And now when you look at it, you can, you can spend a week reading through everything, but, but we try to make it easy to navigate, um, up, up to date, and uh, very pertinent. So, you know, I strongly encourage anybody and everybody to take a look at it. Yeah, I think we're all getting a lot of um, emails, a lot of information from different sources, and I try and look at a lot of different um, websites and go through a lot of different emails because it seems – that there's always something to learn. There's always some resource. There's always some um, program that I wasn't aware of, and that's why it's always good to go through a lot of that information. So we have our first uh, viewer question, and uh, I'll start with David, and then Stephen, if you want to add. It's about the, um, the payroll protection program, and I know that a lot of people are trying to understand the program, and the question is um, uh, regarding furlough. So if some people have been laid off and they're still trying to apply for the payroll protection program. Um, what happens to those who were furloughed? Do you have any advice for those who are trying to make those decisions because they don't know how long it'll be until they get some um, funds from the federal government in order to take care of their employees? Yeah, I'll start and I'll let Stephen chime in. You know, first of all, it's a great question. And um, there's a look forward uh, and the uh, payroll protection program is designed to uh, create funds for businesses to retain their employees 
and there's a look forward period. So if they've been furloughed, um, they certainly can be, can be brought back. And then also there is a component of the program that creates a uh, loan forgiveness. So um, in order to take advantage of that loan forgiveness, um, you have to satisfy certain requirements um, that, that deal with the level of employees that you were at um, when the payroll protection plan was rolled out. If I can add, David, um, you know, I've been working on this payroll protection program for the last week and a half. And um, I mentioned before a lot of changes here and there, but we, we feel that the SBA now ha has put out a very clear, much clearer uh, interpretation of ha how, to, how to navigate through it. And I would emphasize that if there's any small business that has less than 500 employees, uh, you definitely should be looking at this program. Uh, it effectively allows you to take a loan that's equivalent to two and a half times a, an average monthly payroll cost from last year. Okay. And then if you then use it for qualified purposes over the following eight weeks, then you can qualify for the loan forgiveness. It's, it's a little more complicated than that. So I'm just trying to give a very general overview. Now, the, the, the only thing I will add, um, even though it's obviously well intended in dealing with the restaurant and hotel industries, when the business is totally closed right now, there is a significant concern that yes, you can qualify for the loan, get the loan, but if the doors are still closed, how is it that you can think about bringing on uh, people, employees, um, to be able to be actively back at work within that eight week period? So, so there still is some concern. You know, it works well for the contractor industry, which I serve, um, because they, they, they some are still have current work on hand and they expect that, that, you know, everything should open up fairly quick for them to be able to, to, to continue and take advantage of that, you know, provision within the CARES Act. Well, it just goes to show how valuable expertise is. So I'm really grateful that you're able to share all of your expertise and uh, remind um, our viewers and others that there are professionals out there who spend all day long trying to understand new programs and new legislation, and you always want to get uh, professionals to help you with this so you're not making decisions in a vacuum, especially critical business decisions that could have long-term impacts. So we're almost done, but before we finish, I just wanted to give both of you the opportunity, if there's anything we haven't covered today that you think would be really important to share with our viewers uh, about um, remote work and some other topical issues. I can start. I would say, you know, one of the things that I think is, is so important is take care of yourselves, take care of your health, and try to find a balance. It's easy to get um, sucked in behind your computer screen uh, and communicate, communicate, communicate. Communicate to your coworkers. Uh, make sure that they have everything they need. That's one of the things, you know, we're, we're, we're very uh, concerned with is making sure that everybody not only professionally that they have what they need, but that personally that they're being taken care of. And, uh, you know, I would say just communicate, communicate, communicate. Um, I would add to that, um, you know, at Cone, Resnick, at Cone Resnick, we have a sense of purpose. Um, to create opportunities for our people, make a difference for our clients, and to strengthen our community. And I, I truly believe now is the time to give back to our communities in this time of need. Uh, David had mentioned it before, but I also would like to give a special thank you to the healthcare workers and other first responders. You know, whatever challenges we may have in working remotely, it pales in comparison to those uh, on the front lines that are keeping us safe. Uh, we owe them an enormous debt of gratitude, so I'd like to thank them. 
Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Uh, really, uh, and we have so many heroes on the front line, healthcare, and we have our uh, fire department, EMS, and uh, there are lots of other people, whether it's grocery stores or those who are doing all the shipping and delivery so that those who can't go out or have uh, reluctance to go out are getting everything they need delivered to them, and of course, security and other uh, police force and so forth. So I, I thought we were going to wrap up. Two more questions just came in. Uh, okay, so, uh, so I'd like to ask um, the first one to David and then uh, uh, also maybe I'll ask the second one to Stephen. So the, the next question is, other than hospitality, which group of your clients seem to be impacted the most by the current crisis? Uh, what a great question. Yeah, um, hospitality, clearly uh, the most restaurants um, and hotels. And then I, I would say um, after that, you know, everybody's impacted to some degree. You know, construction, there, there's a slowdown. Um, and, and, you know, with the social distancing and, and, and everything else, uh, manufacturing and distribution, you have the same issues with social distancing. Um, retail consumer, um, you know, probably would be the next one after hotel and hospitality. Um, you read what's happening, you know, with, with retail and, um, you know, just the consumer uh, spending is, is overall just, you know, not what it was because people, people aren't getting out. Um, and then um, I think we're going to have to wait and see what the near term impact is for other industries, you know, like life sciences and technology and financial services. Um, but, you know, I think we'll just have to wait and see. And hopefully the CARES Act and relief is going to provide the level setting that we need across the entire economy. You know, and it's starting with employees. It's starting with individuals. And, you know, we're going to have to see relief throughout the whole entire system because when folks can't pay their mortgages, there has to be relief um, on the other side with with the lenders and the lenders have to have relief on the other side uh, with their investors and securitizations and, and things like that. So um, what I said about the cascading effect is we're going to have to find solutions to really prop up the entire economy to get through this. And I think it's going to be a uh, slower um, recovery as people adjust to being outside in larger crowds um, and I think there's going to be a confidence that's going to have to be built up because you know we don't want to have um, another um, outbreak of this that'll set us back further all right so uh, David your uh, part of your answer about the, the federal government response uh, I'm going to use as a segue to our next question which I, I want to ask Stephen to answer uh, so as Congress considers additional stimulus, what is the number one thing the federal government can do to help double down on PPP or something else? Well, well, obviously the federal government is going to come, around, come up with round four uh, of, of the funding. We also have FEMA, and we also have additional clarifications of the existing CARES Act. So the, what, what I see happening is initially you know, with that PPP program, the payroll protection uh, program, uh, you know, that's slotted for $349 billion. Uh, we all expect the demand to be north of that number. And we do expect, you know, it's not guaranteed right now, but we do expect that that amount will be increased with the round four uh, funding process. I also think that the round four will cover more of the mid-sized companies that were not eligible to take advantage of the PPP. And um, so there, there is still going to be the need, a very, a very substantial need for the government to keep stepping up and to uh, fund the economy so that, you know, we can properly work through this as long as it takes and end up in a better spot at the end of the day. Wise words. And David, another question came in. So I want to um, uh, ask you to uh, answer this one. If a business does not have a current relationship with a commercial bank, where can they go to access PPP? 
Um, it's a great question because a lot of the banks have put a priority on customers that they have pre-existing relationships with. Um, and, you know, I think it's a, it's a very good question. Um, certain banks have come out and said, because there was a lot of criticism on that, um, you know, we'll look at, at everybody's application, so, so send it in. Um, but, you know, you, you feel free to call us, and we have relationships throughout the country with different banking institutions, and there also are uh, non-bank enterprises that can provide these PPP loans. So we'll be happy to assist. Uh, but, you know, it's encouraging to see that the banks have come out and said, okay, even if you're not a customer, um, we'll take your application. The problem with that is there wasn't enough funding right out of the chute. So most banks received more demand than they could possibly process. So that's, that's one of the things we're looking for from around four uh, with additional funding. All right, round four reminds me of a boxing match. So how many more rounds do we have to go? Uh, so I want to give uh, Stephen the opportunity um, to uh, uh, cover anything else that I didn't ask about, anything else we haven't discussed that you think would be helpful for the viewers. Um, the one topic that we didn't touch on, which I think is extremely important in this environment, is cybersecurity. You know, in recent weeks, cybersecurity incidents have increased you know, due to the transition to the re remote workplace. You know, the bad guys thrive in times like this with the heightened anxiety and confusion. So, so it's definitely an area that everybody needs to be concerned about, especially with this remote working re remotely. So it's an important topic. All right. Well, I know that uh, I just spent uh, uh, quality time with two uh, experts who uh, really helped me understand things a lot better and uh, provided uh, a very hopeful message that uh, you're here to help and there are others who can help and that we're going to help each other get through this. So David and Stephen, I want to thank you very much for um, giving us your time and sharing your knowledge. And uh, I also want to thank our Platinum sponsors for making this possible. And also thank our viewers for joining us, and we look forward to doing more video chats. And thank you again, and take care. Thank you. Thank you.